Morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Today's scripture reading is from Acts 24, verses 24 through 27. <coughs> Several days after Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. At that same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe, so he sent for him frequently and talked with him. When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, but because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. Well, it's good to see you this morning. Glad that you're here. Uh, let's open with a word of prayer, if we would. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, it's uh, an opportunity now for me to stand up and make use of the gift that you've given me. And I pray that you'll help me by your Holy Spirit. As I bring my fish and my loaf this morning, I pray that you'll multiply it and feed your people. Encourage our hearts today with your word. These stories recorded from so long ago, but they're so relevant with so many principles for Christian living. For us today, help us to see those. In Jesus' name, amen. As you saw on the cover of your bulletin this morning, a young man stepping through a doorway into the light, stepping into eternity. And that doorway is really waiting for each one of us. Sometimes we approach that doorway sooner than we'd like. Sometimes it's very unexpected. There's been a couple of times in my past where I came close to losing my life and, and passing through that doorway prematurely because of my own rebellion and my own undoing. Sometimes we try to undo ourselves and we get in the way of what God wants to do for us here in this life. You know, as we think about the afterlife, we think about eternity. <coughs> I remember something that Peter said in his second letter. He said that the day of the Lord, or a, a day for the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day. So for the Lord where he is in eternity, time really doesn't exist like it does now. There's no clock, there's no minute, there's no hour. For the Lord, a thousand years, can you imagine a millennium is like an hour or a day? And a day is like a thousand years. Time really doesn't factor into who he is or where he's at. And this eternity is waiting for each one of us. And you know, the idea of eternity has been set in the hearts of men. So says the writer of Ecclesiastes in chapter 3, verse 11. He says there that God has set the reality or the thought of eternity in the hearts of men. So really all men across the planet, doesn't matter what nation or what culture or what religious system you find yourself in, everyone has a clue that when this life is over, there's more to come. Eternity set in the hearts of men. I remember also when the Lord Jesus was with his disciples on the last night, on the last night that he was with them, the night he was betrayed, he knew he was going to go to the cross the next day. What would be one of the significant things he would say to his disciples who were going to carry on his name and carry on the mission? He said to them, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, the Father. Believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many rooms, many mansions. And if that were not so, I would have told you so. But it is so, and I go and prepare a place for you, that where I am, there you may be also. So there's Jesus Christ thinking about what? Eternity. Thinking about eternity for us, for his followers, for his men, for those who would be left behind, who would go through a difficult time in sharing Christ with their people and with the Gentiles, imprisoned, beaten, and ultimately martyred for this message of Christ. But he said, as you go through that, 
Don't let your hearts become undone or over troubled because I'm going to prepare a place for you. You know, in God's mind and in the viewpoint of Scripture, when we think about eternity or the afterlife, the, the title of today's message, you know, this, this life on earth is like the acknowledgement page on a book. You know, sometimes we have big books. I've got big books on my shelf of theology and stories and testimonies. And so I always like to read the foreword. I like to read the acknowledgement page to kind of get the gist and background of the author and what he's thinking. In our lifetime here, what, we might get 80 years, 90 years, if we're fortunate? That is just the acknowledgement page on the book. That book being eternity. Once we step through that doorway into God's presence. You know, the scripture says to be absent from the body, this body of dust and clay that is so prone to disease, illness, and sickness, and falls by the wayside. You know, our, our life is short, and our eternity is long. And God wants to prepare our hearts for eternity, prepare our future there. And that's why God goes to prepare a place for us. That's why eternity is really in our hearts. That's why Peter let us know that time really doesn't exist where we're going. And so our lives is like just a page in a book that acknowledges what's about to happen. And how will we live out that page or that chapter? Now, if you think about eternity, you know, I said a book. But you know what? That's going to turn into a volume of books, 10, 20 books, like an encyclopedia, and then there's another set after that, and then another set after that, in light of being in eternity forever and ever, and then there's another bookshelf, and then there's another library room. I mean, think about eternity in light of our lives. Our lives are so small, and so Jesus Christ wants us to live those lives in a fruitful and productive way to where when we stand before him, we won't shrink away. The scripture says that sometimes people will go before him and they'll shrink away in shame. Because they knew him, but they didn't live for him. They knew him, but they didn't act like they knew him. Don't be one of those people. You know, spend your 70, 80, 50 years serving the Lord. Now, in the story today, the Apostle Paul is sharing the idea of eternity with Felix, the governor of Judah. And we see from the life of the Apostle Paul that's taking up most of the book of Acts, and here in the later chapters, it's really a blow-by-blow -blow life of Paul as he's experiencing um, on his way to Rome, being imprisoned, and on his way there for the trial, probably to be executed, indeed he would be executed. And so as I read all these paragraphs and all these long chapters about the Apostle Paul, and now we're going to look at this paragraph here at the end of chapter 24, Lord Jesus, what is this about, why is this important, and what can we pull out of the story? One of the main things that you pull out is that the Apostle Paul was living a life that was preparing for eternity. And he was trying to tell Felix, the governor, that eternity was waiting for him. That this life isn't a, just about what we can gather, what we can put together, what we can make ourselves comfortable. That's what most of the world does. So we find ourselves in the story here this morning. And of course, we know that the Apostle Paul was in Jerusalem. A riot happened. The Romans had to get a, a, a patrol of commandos to take him at night from Jerusalem to Caesarea. And now he's in captivity in Caesarea, and he's brought before Felix. Felix brings in the Sanhedrin. They just keep complaining about Paul being a ringleader of the Nazarene sect, someone who causes riots, someone who talks ill about the law of Moses, but all of that was not true. And so Felix hears his story that we heard last time, and now Felix has decided to dismiss the Sanhedrin. 
he dismissed the Roman guards who brought him to Caesarea, and he tells Paul, listen, I can't let you go. These Jews are so much trouble. They're such a pain in the neck. I've got to keep you in arrest, in captivity. But what I'll do is I'll put you in house arrest, and I'm going to assign a centurion to you. And you can live in this home, but the centurion is going to be with you 24-7. He'll never leave your side. You'll never leave his sight. Now, you can have friends come and go from the house. You can go out shopping in the market, but this centurion is always going to be next to you. And so, in a way, he was given freedom, but in another way, he was held captive and couldn't leave until Felix decided what to do with him. Now, in the story today, as Rob read, we find out that Felix was married to Drusilla, not to be confused with Cruella. <laughs> I had to throw that in there, uh, but she was... She was Jew, you know, Pastor Jack is playing with jokes, I got to throw out a few once in a while, you know? Um, so Felix is married to Drusilla, and she is a Jew. Uh, she's a, like a Jewish princess, actually. She was married to another governor. Um, in the story, in the historical background, you find out that Felix is like mid-age, you know, he's in his 40s, maybe 50s. Drusilla is a teenager. She's not yet 20 years old. Now, Felix was known to be a very cruel Roman governor, really treating the Jews terribly. He stole Drusilla as someone else's wife because he was in love with her. So Felix is not a good guy, doesn't have a good heart, doesn't have a good life record, and doesn't have a good destiny in eternity. And so, the Apostle Paul wants to share his faith in Christ with him, that he might be saved. It's interesting that Felix, after putting him under house arrest, would then secretly have Paul come into his room and talk with him, him and his wife, Drusilla. Talk about this sect called the Way. Talk about this carpenter from Nazareth, this Nazarene sect that you're a part of. Felix was actually very familiar with the Christian message. And so it says here that several days later, after Sanhedrin left and Paul's in house and rest, verse 24, several days later, Felix came in with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. And he sent for Paul to listen to him as he spoke. And when Paul came in to speak to Felix, what did Paul talk about? It says here, he talked about faith in Jesus Christ. Now, I think it's helpful to know what shoes Paul were standing in. Sometimes it's really important when you read the story to put yourself in their shoes. Paul was under arrest. Paul knew that a trial was coming, knew that his life was in jeopardy, and knew that Felix was cruel. Now, Paul could have maybe tried to talk politics or maybe tried to talk his way out of the situation, but Paul allowed himself to be in that situation and surrendered himself to the sovereign will of God. I'm under house arrest, I'm probably going to be on my way to Rome, it's probably not going to go well, and as I go through this journey, I'm going to talk about my faith in Christ. And so he talks to Felix and Drusilla about his faith. Now this is the verse I want to focus on for a few minutes, verse 25. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough. You may leave now. When I find it convenient, I will send for you again. Now this verse is extremely important for Christians. It was back then, it is today. Because a lot of times, as I go witnessing with believers, they will ask me, or in church, you know, they will ask me, you know, as we share our faith, I'm not sure what to say. I'm not sure what to focus on. Well, first off, you need to be brave, by the Holy Spirit. That's why God gave us the Holy Spirit. You cannot do it without the Holy Spirit. You have that boldness to talk about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come. Now start talking about those ideas and topics with this age and culture and society in America. Talk to, start to talk to them about self-control, 
Start to talk to them about righteousness. Start to talk about judgment to come. You're not going to be popular. You're going to lose friends. People are going to be offended. But you know what? This is what you need to say to them. Because this is what Paul said to him. And you think, well, you know, I, I'm nervous and, and I got things to lose. I could lose the friendship. They may not like me. They may some, say something mean to me. They may spread gossip about me and I'll lose other friends. If we stand in Paul's shoes, we see that he had a lot to lose, didn't he? He had lost everything for Christ. His money, his position, his wealth, his house, his house, his reputation in Jerusalem. He was an upcoming powerful lawyer. He was the best in the Pharisee sect. And he gave all that up. You know, we hear him say that in the book of Philippians. I considered everything lost for the gain of knowing Christ my Savior and serving Him. I considered everything garbage, rubbish, smelly. I'm taking it out to the curb. What did he take out to the curb? His career, his wealth, his position, his power, his reputation, his home, his chariot, his nice clothes, his membership at the spa. You know they have spas <laughs> in this He gave all that up, and he considered it garbage. Well, see, when I read about the Apostle Paul, it convicts me. And I bring it up in a direct, sensitive way to convict you. That's what this is for. This isn't for pastors to get up here and give funny stories and make you feel comfortable and good. No, this is to make you feel uncomfortable <laughs> and be motivated by the example and the life example and lifestyle of the Apostle Paul. So Paul talks about righteousness. He talks about righteousness. And we're going to take each word and then, and then we're going to close in a minute. He's going to talk about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Righteousness. Now, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be confused about righteousness. There's, what I'm learning from Scripture, really just in the last couple of years in a more definitive way, is that there's two kinds of righteousness. There's one that Jesus Christ provides for you, so that you are righteous, clean, and holy before the Father. On your best day, on your worst day, you are clothed with a white robe of righteousness by the blood of Jesus Christ. So that's done. Hallelujah. <laughs> you can't count on, well, you know, one day I'm at 55% righteousness, but <laughs> on Thursday I was at 85% righteousness, <laughs> so I hope that I die on that day. <laughs> no, none of that matters. <laughs> once you believe in Jesus Christ and are washed with his blood, it is done, sealed, delivered. That's why Paul says, seal with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. That's a promise. But there's another part of righteousness where God wants you to grow and walk in righteousness and not be a slob, not continue to sin. You know, that's what he says in Romans. Shall I continue to sin that grace may abound? If God is so loving, forgiving, and graceful, and grace-filled, and grace-extending, then, man, I can just kind of go back to the way I was, right? Go back to the bar and whatever. It is. There's so many things. But no, Paul says in Romans, Shall I continue to sin that grace may abound? And he says, May it never be. May it never be so. And the Greek language here is super strong. By no means do that. Are you kidding? You're bought with the blood of Christ. God loves you dearly. You're set for eternity. You're sealed with the Spirit. Matter of fact, Paul says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit that's been set down inside you. So God is concerned with righteousness. You know, walking and living in righteousness. And what is righteousness? Well, Jesus is a good example. You know, we look at the life of Jesus. We look at the life of Paul. And they were... People of prayer. Are you a person of prayer? They were people of the Word of God. Are you a person of the Word of God? They were a person that was devoted to the Lord. Spent time with Him in a relationship. Knew it was about a relationship. 
Jesus spent time serving his father. Paul spent time serving the Lord Jesus. Do you serve the Lord Jesus? I think a lot of times in America, in the church, is I think Christians get in the bad habit of coasting. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slide into church, you know, when it's convenient, when I feel up to, when i got time. Huh. All right. and, and then hopefully the pastor is going to be funny, it's going to feel good, you know, I'm not going to be too convicted. You know, sometimes people don't come because they're too convicted. Well, that's not going to stop. And uh, so God calls us to so much more than that, a commitment to walk with him and love him and serve him, walking in righteousness. And that also means giving up bad habits. And I know that's hard. Trust me. Pastor knows too. Pastor had some bad ones. And we get help by the Holy Spirit. We get help by each other. That's why the body of Christ is so important. That's why we need to come here and be together. I don't know how many times I'm around my brothers and sisters, and they need loving. They need prayer. They need friendship. They need talk. They need a talking to. They need someone to listen to them. That's what the body of Christ is for. And if you remove yourself from the body of Christ, you remove yourself from a blessing and help and encouragement and accountability to walk in the way of righteousness. So Paul talks to Felix about this, about righteousness. And that righteousness is provided by Christ. And that's why he talks about Jesus Christ. Now, Paul tell, talks about two things that in the language are tied together. Self-control and judgment to come. It's interesting, something that Paul said in the previous chapter, and so if you just look over to chapter 24, I want to look at verses 14 and 16 about this idea of self-control. Because Paul not only preached it, but he lived it. Listen to what he said, verse 14 of the previous chapter 24. However, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way, which they call a sect, wrongly so, I believe everything that is in accordance with the law and what is written in the prophets. I believe in the word of God. I believe the law is good. And I believe in everything the prophets said. Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micah, Hosea, Daniel. All those guys are speaking for the Lord. And every word they said is correct. And I believe it. And he goes on to say, And I have the same hope in God as these men standing before me. This was the point where the Sanhedrin were ganging up on them. But see the difference between Paul and the Sanhedrin? All those Pharisees and Sadducees who had gathered, they knew the Hebrew Bible in the original language. They could quote the prophets and the, and the Psalms and the law. But the difference between a religious person who knows the Bible and goes to the temple every day and between the Apostle Paul is one thing. Jesus Christ. Do you know him? Do you trust in him? Do you know he's the Messiah? So, Paul goes on to say, I have the same hope as these men here, that there will be a resurrection, listen to this, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. Make a note of that. Notice that Paul in the scripture talks about everybody's resurrected, everybody. The righteous will be resurrected unto eternal life. The wicked get their bodies back and is resurrected to eternal destruction. See, that's why Paul brings it up. Felix, <coughs> you live like hell. You treat people like dirt. You've swapped wives three times. You're cruel to the Jews, God chosen people. You know what, Felix? You're in trouble with God. That's what he talks about. Righteousness. Felix, do you have any? He should be recognizing that he doesn't. Mm -hmm. Felix, do you have any self-control? Mm -hmm. Paul says here, both the righteous and the wicked are resurrected. People need to know that. He goes on, this is the, this is the point. So he says in verse 16, so because of this truth, verse 16, 24, so I strive always. I strive every day, always, to keep my conscience clear before God and before men. 
Wow. <laughs> Here's the Apostle Paul who knows what it means to find righteousness in Jesus Christ. But Paul says, and this is strong Greek words by the way, I strive, I work hard every day to keep my conscience clear before God and before men. It's not just about you keeping it clear with others, but it's about you keeping it clear with God. You know, don't let any sin or unrighteousness or habit creep in that will, what, cloud your conscience. He says, I want to keep my conscience clear. So, from what I gather what Paul's saying and from what he said previously is that righteousness is important, self-control is important, and then he talks about the judgment to come. The judgment to come. Now, that's always tough to talk about because most people don't want to hear that, but I can tell you that that is highly motivating. I remember as a boy, um, this was in the 60s, I was just six or seven years old, and my parents were dragging me to church three times a week. <laughs> and uh, I remember, I don't know if you remember this church, you can maybe tell me about it. We were living in Detroit, he was going to Detroit Bible College. And uh, I, me and my brother were just these little street rats running around the neighborhood. As a matter of fact, that night, you had to come and find me on the street. You know, you pulled up in your car, Troy, what are you doing? It's time for church. You know, it's 6 p.m. on a Sunday night, and I was totally oblivious. I was like six. He grabs me in the car, and we go to church. But you know what? That night, I don't know who was preaching. I don't know if it was you. But, matter of fact, I was so dirty that you didn't let me come into the service. You took me down to the basement, and you stepped me by the speaker and said, sit there and don't move. <laughs> and in that speaker, you could hear the preacher. I was six. And so I'm sitting there all dirty, sweaty from the day. And I'm listening to this preacher on the speaker. And you know that he spent 45 minutes preaching about hell. <laughs> and judgment to come. And you were six. And I was six. You know what? That got my attention. And that scared the living daylights out of me. But you know what? It planted a seed of truth in my heart that would spring up later. Little boy Troy, six years old, guess what? There's this place called hell, and you don't want to go there. So you need to find out what that's about. Sometimes a preacher, whether you're six or whether you're 66, you know, you need to hear, you need to hear about the judgment to come. Now, I want to read a passage here, if my eyes are, if my eyes are going to work, from the letter of Hebrews. The letter of Hebrews talking about the judgment to come. And it says here, just, just two sentences. I love the way he says this. There's so many passages you could read about the judgment to come, but I just selected this one. It says here, But he, Christ, has appeared once for all in the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Wow, what an epic statement. He, Christ, has appeared for all at the culmination of the ages. What does that mean? He appeared at the very right moment in history and gave himself as a sacrifice for others. That's why he came, a sacrifice for us to pave the way for us into righteousness, into eternal life, because we had no option of doing it on our own. Christ is the doorway to eternal life. He's the gate by which we enter, the prophets tell us. Uh, just as people are destined to die once, and after that to face judgment, Okay, so the writer of Hebrews says the same thing that Paul's saying. Because people die once, and when they die, after that they face judgment. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away sin, but there's a way out of judgment. There's a way through judgment. Christ was sacrificed to take away sin of the many. And, by the way, he will appear a second time. First time, he was the Lamb of God, sacrificed, humiliated, shed his blood, gave his life to pay the price for your horrible sin, and he took all that horrible sin on himself. It was degrading, it was horrible, it was horrifying, it was poisonous to him. Well, the first time he came to provide you a way out, but guess what? He's appearing a second time, and this time it'll be different. He will appear a second time not to bear the weight of the world, not to bear the weight of sin, but to bring salvation 
to those who are waiting for him. He's going to bring salvation. He's going to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords, sitting on the throne of Jerusalem, on the throne of David, fulfilling all those prophecies. And bringing salvation to those who love him, believe in him, and are waiting for him. So that kind of asks a question, are you, are we, waiting for him? Waiting for him. You know, I didn't get that for a long time. You, know. you, you have this feeling of, yeah, you know what, I'm, I'm tired of this world. I'm tired of this broken, sinful body. I'm tired of the complexities of life. I'm tired of the way this world, society, and culture is going. You know what? I'm waiting for you. I'm waiting for you to pull into the dock and take me somewhere else because this world stinks. <laughs> you watch the news, right? No. What's, what's, well, maybe that's for the best. I cannot believe what I'm seeing in the news. I cannot believe it. The polarization, the hatred, the epidemic of murder, the suicide rate, the drug abuse rate, families broken, economy shaky, everyone's confused about what's next. Politicians, right? God help us. Who are we going to count on? Them? <laughs> You're going to count on the Lord, and we're going to count on each other. So Paul talks about, hey Felix, it's important for you to know faith in Jesus Christ. It's important for you to know about righteousness. It's important for you to get a grip on self-control. And it's important for you to know that judgment is coming. So listen to how Felix responded. So classic. Felix was afraid and said, that's enough. That's enough. Too much conviction. I'm walking out of this church. When I find it convenient, I will send for you again. When I feel up to it, when this conviction dies down, I'll have you come and talk to me again. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. <laughs> so he would send for him frequently and talk with him. So here's Felix. He's afraid and convicted. But really, all he really wants is bribe. So what does it tell me about Felix? He's hardening his heart to the message of the gospel. And all he's really concerned about is gain. Gain. What else is he concerned about? It says here, when two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus, but because Felix wanted to grant him a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. <laughs> so, he wanted to look good in front of the Jews. He didn't want to cause any political turmoil. He was protecting his reputation. I couldn't help but see it by the Holy Spirit about Felix's heart. He had conviction. All he really wanted was money, and all he was concerned about was his reputation. Isn't that the heart of today? Mm -hmm. The heart of Felix. You see it in Scripture? This story is 2,000 years old. It's 2021 in the house of God. But you know what? The story and the heart and the principles are the same. You see that? So, Thursday, uh, some of my brothers and sisters, along with I, went out into the community to share faith in Christ and pass out gospel tracts that explain it in a simple written form. So, hey, if you're not going to listen to me, don't got time, take it home and read it. And they can hear the written gospel. Possibly be saved, because that's what the Holy Spirit needs. He needs the Word. He needs the gospel. So we're up there sharing our faith, trying to talk to people, passing out tracts. We've passed out some flyers. For the family fest, I invited a couple families. I hope they come. If you see new families here, by all means, go be friends with them and bridge that gap. So um, I happened to pass by a young man on a skateboard. And uh, I struck up a conversation. He was very friendly and talkative. So we stood there and talked for probably a good 10 minutes. I found out that he was a Muslim and went to a local mosque not far from here. Uh, but he was interested in talking about the Lord. Of course, the way he sees it and the way I see it may be different. And um, so we were talking about the Lord and talking about our faith in, in Christ. I was, 
And uh, I was looking for help from the Holy Spirit. How do I get through this guy? And I said, by the way, what's your name? After through the conversation, he said, my name's Joseph. I said, oh. I said, do you know that Joseph in the Old Testament was the prince of Egypt and has quite a story? He says, yeah, I know the story. He knows the scriptures. I said, you also know that Jesus' stepfather was Joseph? Yeah, I know the story. And I said, and I asked him, I said, do you believe in the story of Jesus? Do you believe in what he did? And he looked at me puzzled, and I said, you know, he died on the cross. And so I get a chance to tell the gospel to a Muslim. You know, he died on the cross to save you from sin, that you might be forgiven by God the Father. And he rose from the dead, conquering death, that you might have eternal life. And he's looking at me, and uh, he said, well, I know we all believe in God, and I know that there's many ways to heaven. And I said, Joseph, I said, I understand what you're saying, but you know what? Isn't there something beautifully distinctive about Jesus? What other person died on the cross to make a way for you to God the Father? And what other person rose from the dead? There's something distinctive about Jesus. And you know what? He didn't know what to say. And I said, Joseph, I invite you to my church. He said, well, where is it? So I gave him a flyer. I said, the address is there. Come on that day. I'll befriend you with the great people. We'll have food. I don't think he's so tied to his mosque or, Muslim, or Islam that he would may not come here. And, uh, and then the Holy Spirit prompted me, before you go, give him a trick. I said, okay. I said, I said Joseph, I want you to take this track and, and read it, and it'll tell you more about the distinctive beauty of Jesus Christ. And he said, okay. So then I'm walking away. And I kept thinking, you know, don't turn back, don't make him look nervous. But about 30 seconds later, I turned back. He was sitting at the cross, <laughs> reading that track. Praise Jesus. There it is. The church sharing Jesus with people in our community. That's what Paul was doing. And that's what I encourage you to do along with me. It's not complicated. You know what? This whole thing is not complicated. It's simply about one thing. Will you, will you be obedient? Will you be obedient? And I give me an example of that. I can't just preach about it and never do it. That is plain. So that's why I get out there. I'm no evangelist, but I get out there. Like Timothy, like Paul told Timothy. Timothy, your gift of teaching. And by the way, do the work of an evangelist. And do the work of an evangelist. And I hope that you'll join me. And we have to share the strong truths of righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come. That's what the story's about. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we're grateful today that we can look into your word for a few minutes and see the beauty of what you're calling us to do. The Apostle Paul is the example to us. He's, he's the true north example to us. And should inspire us, encourage us, convict us to be like him, to be like Paul. And Paul was always saying, I want to be like Jesus. And so help us, Lord, here. I know we have different personalities and different temperaments, but help us be obedient to the Holy Spirit and the gospel that we might build your kingdom here. In Jesus' name, amen.